to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. This is Matt Lynch. I'm a co-host with Matt Bates, Drew Johnson, Aaron Heim, Chris Tilling, and Amy Brown-Hughes. Thanks so much for listening in. Special thanks to our team for helping produce and develop this show, including Mim Ward and Creative Design, and I'll let the others introduce themselves. I'm James Steinbach, Web Development. Rebecca Turhian, Media and Marketing. I'm Ed Hattie, and I produce the show. If you haven't had a chance to go over to iTunes and give us a rating or wherever you listen to the show, we'd really appreciate that because it helps people find out about the podcast and spreads the word. If you're just unable to do that um, and want to take a slightly different path, you could join a local chapter of the American Racing Pigeon Society or the equivalent in the country where you live. And uh, as we all know, pigeons are a great way to send messages. You just write, you you know, on script.study on a piece of paper, rubber band that sucker to the pigeon's foot, send it on its way, person receives it. They'll appreciate the personal touch, and I think it's that personal touch that really helps get the word out. Social media only takes us so far. Pigeons can go farther. So we'd appreciate that, and we hope today that you enjoy this episode. Welcome back, OnScript listeners. Our guests today are Ben Witherington III and Jason Myers. Jason is Associate Professor of Biblical Studies at Greensboro College, where he teaches New Testament, and he's a lecturer in New Testament Studies at Westminster Theological Center in the UK, so we used to be colleagues there. In addition to the book Voices and Views on Paul that he's co-authored with Dr. Ben Witherington III, he's written Paul, the Apostle of Obedience, Reading Obedience in Romans, and he's co-authored another book with Ben called Paul of Arabia, The Hidden Years of the Apostle to the Gentiles. Dr. Ben Witherington will be well known to many of our, our listeners. He's the Gene R. Amos Professor of New Testament for Doctoral Studies at Asbury Theological Seminary. He's the author of more than 60 books, including commentaries on every book in the New Testament. Among his more well-known books are The Jesus Quest, The Third Search for the Jew of Nazareth, and The Paul Quest, The Renewed Search for the Jew of Tarsus. He was on the BBC PBS special called The Story of Jesus as well. So, Jason and Ben, welcome to OnScript. Welcome, Matt. Glad to be here. Good to be here. Before we get to talking about voices and views on Paul, which is our focus today, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about your other book that's forthcoming, or is it out now? Um, Paul of Arabia, The Hidden Years of the Apostle to the Gentiles. Well, it's a historical novella. Um, and like the Week in the Life series that I helped generate for InterVarsity, uh, this book has closer look sections, which is what Jason contributed to the volume. So what it is, is an, an act of creative historical imagination based on what little evidence we have, trying to fill in the gaps of what happened to Paul ap- after Damascus Road for three plus years when he went off to Arabia, which is Petra, and Mm -hmm. uh, what did happen then. And then what happens when he finally goes to Jerusalem and they send him off to Syria, Cilicia, to his home region of Tarsus and say, uh, you know, we'll don't call us, we'll call you. Um, So what happened during those, you know, hidden years? And so it's an attempt to sort of fill in the gaps a little bit with some creative imagination and fill in the context through the closer look sections. So is it historical fiction or, I mean, is it like, how, how are you positioning that book? Well, that's part of the problem. My agent said, I don't know what this is. What, what Mm. is this? Is this a history book? Is this a fiction book? I said, yes. Um, mm-hmm. So I just call it a historical novella. And in that regard, it would be like other ancient historical works, for example, on Cicero or Julius Caesar, where there are some gaps they have to fill in and they do so. 
And Jason, your contributions are filling out some of the background as well, or yeah, doing the historical look section. So at various places in the story, you kind of take a you know a commercial break, if you will, uh, and you get a little bit of ancient history, ancient social world stuff to help people understand different parts of the narrative. So, for example, Paul, you know, gets on a boat. Um, what was it like to do travel in the ancient world? What were the challenges and and aspects to that? And so it's kind of like you know getting kids to eat eat their vegetables. You kind of got to put them, you know in between the layers of lasagna here. Um, and so it kind of jumps back and forth, and hopefully will be a pretty accessible way for people to, one, get excited about the story, but also learn a little bit along the way. Fantastic. So let's move on to your book, um, Voices and Views on Paul, exploring scholarly trends that you co-authored together. Just sort of by way of framing this book, um, I'd like to step back for a, m- a moment uh, to the kind of wider interests that you have. So Ben, I'm going to start with you and ask, broadly speaking, what is it that captivates you about the story of Jesus that has led you to dedicate so much of your life and, you know, your scholarship, 60 plus books, to understanding and teaching about him? Well, it's it's not so much that there was something about the life of Jesus that just wouldn't leave me alone. Uh, it, It has to do with the fact, I mean, I grew up in the church from day one. I mean, my mother says that my first two words were John Wesley. I was baptized as an infant and was in the church all throughout grade school, through high school, was an MYF chairman, went off to Carolina. And at at Carolina came the time for me to uh, ask the question, am I going to appropriate my faith for myself? Mm -hmm. I'd always liked Jesus, loved Jesus, tried to emulate Jesus along the way. But what really galvanized me in terms of doing the career that I pursued is great teachers. Uh, You know, they say you become what you admire. Well, I had a fabulous Bible teacher at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, whose name was not Bart Ehrman, who's there in that chair now. His name was Bernard Boyd. And over 5,000 people that he taught from the 50s, 60s into the 70s went into some kind of ministry. It was quite an amazing impact, and he was a dynamic lecturer. I mean, his classes were always packed out. There were people sitting in the windows to come to these lectures, and it was a spiritually turbulent time, much like now. So he really inspired me to go off to seminary, and then I had Gordon Fee and Andrew Lincoln and various other great teachers, Bruce Metzger, Uh, in my seminary years, and then I had C.K. Barrett and Charles Cranfield and T.H.O. Parker at the doctoral level. I mean, it was an embarrassment of riches. So the teachers provided for me a model of how I could spend my life doing these things. The, The other thing to say about this is I always loved languages. I always loved history. I always loved literature. I have an English lit degree from Carolina I love the classics, the Greek and Latin classics. And I asked myself, well, what profession could I go into where I get to do all of that at once? Mm. And the answer was the Bible. Yeah. And and you also lead trips to Israel, don't you? Well, I lead trips to all of the lands of the Bible. Yeah. I've I've spent actually a lot more time in Turkey in the last Mm. 20 years than in Israel. What are your favorite places to lead people to? Well, in Israel... The favorite place for me would be Caesarea of Philippi, because, of course, that's where the first great confession takes place, according to Mark 8, with Peter saying, you demand, and uh, and then not understanding at all the implications of what he had just said. So he sort of goes from the penthouse to the outhouse, where, you know, you are the Christ, and then Jesus says, and the Son of Man must suffer many things and be killed on the third day rise, and Peter says, no way is that happening to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So (laughs) it's quite the story. But the context of the story is what makes it a story. Because Caesarea Philippi was formerly Panyas or Banyas, a pagan shrine. All kinds of pagan gods being worshipped there, including most recently the emperor. There was an imperial cult of Augustus there. So why did Jesus leave the Holy Land? and go there, north of the Holy Land, and then ask the question, who do people say that I am? Well, Jesus is implying, you know, I'm the contender, they're the pretenders, I'm the reality of which they are only a parody. 
So he's comparing himself to the pagan deities and saying they are not the real deal. And so and to me, that, that I've seen so many Ohio moments when people have co- heard the context and then reread the text of Mark 8 and went, oh, so this is why context matters to your study of the Bible. Right. That would seem to have significant Christological implications. Um, Jason, what drew you into Pauline studies? Uh, what, what do you find so compelling about Paul? Similar to Ben, I, I grew up in the church uh, as well. There isn't really a, kind of a moment where I don't have a memory uh, that wasn't rooted in some sort of kind of church experience. But I think for me, similar uh, in undergrad, just seeing some of the puzzle pieces come together a little bit actually with, with Paul um, and kind of seeing him speak uh, kind of in, in his world to this division uh, between Jew and Gentile um, and seeing how kind of the reconciliation uh, of these groups are part of what God is up to uh, in this world uh, was deeply, deeply compelling to me uh, growing up um, as well, seeing rampant kind of division and uh, certainly even more so, um, you know, in, in recent years. Uh, I just find Paul to be a very compelling uh, person. I find him to be a very inspiring person. Um, and, you know, there's something about studying someone who's so often misunderstood um, that I think there is a is a great way of helping people kind of rediscover, I think, who the actual Paul was and not really kind of the interpretations of Paul that we've come to live with. Um, and so I think that's drawn me a little bit of how do we uncover ancient people, ancient persons uh, in their context and then see them kind of come alive and speak to our world today. Yeah, I can really resonate with uh, the, the misunderstood uh, subject matter that you teach. I mean, in teaching the Old Testament, one of the things I love is that people often come with either low expectations or expectations that they're, they're ready to see uh, or, or uh, assumptions they're ready to see overturned, uh, but don't know how. So that's probably similar with Paul as well. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us about the space that this new book uh, takes up in comparison with um, other uh, editions, for instance, Ben, of the, the Paul quest. Um, besides, you know, taking in new literature, how, how, do, how does this, book sit in relation to other uh, books that are out there right now? First of all, this book was supposed to be Paul Quest Part 2. <laughs> However, Paul Quest Part 1 was an investigation of the trinity of Paul's identity. He was a Jew. He was a Roman citizen. He was a follower of Christ. And it was unpacked in, in sort of those three categories. So there was a particular focus on Paul himself with discussions along the way of what scholars were saying and how they were investigating who Paul really was. This book is really not that. This book is what's happened since the Paul quest that is sort of changed the contours of our discussion of Paul and his letters and how should we assess things like the new perspective on Paul. So that's, it, it's a rather different kind of book. To, to get people back up to speed on what is the recent discussion on Paul. And, and who are some of the figures that um, you think are important for a, a reader who, who's maybe not immersed in, in Pauline scholarship uh, to become familiar with um, in, the, in the sort of early turn toward interest in those three uh, areas that you just mentioned? Well, there are certain towering figures that have sort of dominated the landscape like giant dinosaurs. And uh, one of those would be E.P. Sanders. Uh, I mean, I was there in 1977, B.C., before cell phone, when his first volume on Paul and Judaism came out in 1977 in England. And it sort of dropped like a bombshell on Europe. Uh, both in the UK and then in Germany as well. And uh, and then the ripples went across the Atlantic Ocean to America at the same time because Sanders had this enormous knowledge of early Judaism. And, and n- without the caricatures that some of the earlier literature on Paul had involved, like Paul was an antinomian. He hated, you know, he broke out in a rash anytime he saw a law and that sort of stuff, all false, <laughs> you know. And, and so Sanders was busy correcting 
A, the images of early Judaism, and B, the images of Paul in the context of early Judaism. And, and really, it sort of created a sort of Copernican revolution of thinking. But the real impact of it did not fully come in regard to revising how we looked at Paul until like the late 80s, 90s, into the 21st century. And, mm -hmm. and that's why, you know, we devoted a considerable amount of time to him. I mean, there were precursors. We dealt a little bit with Christer Stendhal in there, and that was imp important. But Sanders was really the big dog that everybody had to respond to, or else you just didn't know what you were talking about. And, uh, and that sort of set the whole thing in motion. And the, the people who came after him were really responding to him as well as to the Pauline literature. People like Jimmy Dunn, of, now of blessed memory, who just passed away a month or so ago. Um, people like Larry Hurtado as well. Uh, you know, other scholars were an N.T. Wright, of course, really responding to Sanders. I mean, there was a time when they both taught at Oxford at the same time. And so they had all kinds of skin in the game, if you will. And so we, we wanted to deal with the big thinkers that have had the biggest impact on Pauline thought since the Paul Quest. I'm wondering if um, you could take a, a sort of uh, <clears throat> one event in Paul's life. So Paul's Damascus Road experience and and run it through three filters. So how do new perspective on Paul scholars, uh, apocalyptic Paul and Paul within Judaism folks read that experience differently. So maybe Jason, if you want to touch on a couple of those and then Ben, if you want to add to that as well. Yeah, I think the, this kind of test case is a helpful way to kind of showcase some of the, the strengths of the book. Um, Cause you know, we have this singular uh, kind of event, right? Told multiple times in acts, but the ways in which interpreters approach that question is probably the real benefit of this book of saying, okay, how do we interpret this? Um, so, you know, if you're going to run the Damascus Road experience through that, um, you know, the new perspective on Paul, you know, would emphasize that Paul really had more of a, of a calling rather than a conversion uh, experience, right? So he's not converting, because um, there's some baggage with that term, right? It's not like someone's converting from polytheism to monotheism, right? Um, and so they'd maybe emphasize more that Paul had a new calling on his life, uh, to preach to the Gentiles, um, but that he didn't convert in the sense of like from being Jewish to being a Christian, since that would obviously be an anachronistic term. Um, you know, I think the apocalyptic Paul uh, would would come in, uh, that, that camp would come in and say, you know, it was this otherworldly revelation um, that Paul could not have gotten anywhere else, um, and that it was this dramatic experience that showed him kind of the world the way it was, uh, with these kind of overarching powers of of sin and death holding all humanity captive um, and that they would stress more of that kind of um, symbolic sense to that experience of what Paul really saw <laughs> in that moment. Uh, whereas the new perspective would probably show a little bit more continuity of yes, Paul's a Jewish person, uh, but you know, he, he still has a lot of lot in common uh, with that, but he's going to have some critique of what this means then for um, other Jewish groups. Uh, and this would, of course, distinguish both these movements from the Paul within Judaism uh, kind of growing um, uh, unit here that would say, um, yeah, Paul might have had a call to go preach to the Gentiles. It might have been otherworldly, uh, but that really didn't change much uh, for him or his contemporaries. Um, and it really applies to Gentiles only um, in this context. And so they would all have, if you sat around the table, they'd all have you know various points of agreement and disagreement. Um, I think they they would agree on, you know, Paul isn't necessarily um, to different degrees criticizing Judaism or first century Judaisms by any means. Um, but what the, what does that mean going forward is where they would kind of start to part ways. Yeah, one thing that we did not do in this book is one of the growing areas in the field of Pauline studies is Jewish scholars evaluating Paul. And there are a lot of them. I mean, a lot of them. And uh, in part of that project, whether we're talking about Paula Fredrickson or Daniel Boyarin or on and on and on, I mean, there are a lot of them, Shay Cohen, um, is 
most of them want to reappropriate Paul for Judaism, you know, and they're, they're not happy with this notion that Paul is the founder of Christianity and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, and, and I mean, there are even people like Mark Nanos who say, Paul never left the synagogue. The early Christian meetings were all in synagogues and this, that, and the other. False. Nevertheless, a new interesting reading of Paul. And, and so uh, because that is such a huge subject, we could have written a book at least as big as Voices and Views on Paul just on the mm -hmm. Jewish response to Paul in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. We left that one in abeyance for somebody else or may, maybe some future time because they really mostly operate with a two-track model. And this is how Jews get saved. This is how Christians get saved. Uh, bless his heart. Paul had a ministry to Gentiles and only to Gentiles. So nothing that Paul was saying was specifically directed to Jews. It was directed to Gentiles and is not applicable to Jews in various ways. Now, that's obviously a pretty radical reading of Paul, who said, you know, there is no Jew or Gentile in Christ, uh, and a wrong reading of Paul, frankly. But uh, nevertheless, we were trying to deal with those things that would be more likely affecting the evangelical community or the larger Christian community in their views of Paul. Uh, rather than that kind of view of Paul. Sure. So we, we've talked about the um, Damascus Road experience, and um, I realize we haven't introduced these views yet. So uh, maybe if each of you want to give like a soundbite of of the the chapter you the chapters you wrote and and the views uh, on Paul that are represented by those, maybe we could just highlight in particular the new perspective on Paul. And the apocalyptic Paul, which which obviously uh, play major roles in your book. Well, in terms of the new perspective, there it really is new perspectives <laughs> plural, <laughs> because in, there is a lot of disagreement. Um, all of them tend to agree that previous views of Paul are inadequate. What they don't agree on is what they want to replace it with, and so there are a variety of things. For example. Um, let's take the phrase pistis Christu, literally faith of Christ. Mm -hmm. Is it an objective genitive or is it a subjective genitive? Is it faith in Christ, which is uh, it's how it's often been translated up to the 21st century, or is it the faithfulness of Christ? Well, there are people like, for example, Richard Hayes or Tom Wright would say that it's about the faithfulness of Christ there are other ways that Paul expresses faith in Christ, namely he uses a preposition, in. Um, okay, but within the new perspective, there's somebody like Jimmy Dunn who's going, nope, not convinced, not convinced, or John Barclay, not convinced on that particular issue. What they do seem to agree on, for the most part, is that when Paul talks about works of the law, He's not talking about the law in general. He's talking about the boundary rituals, the Sabbath, circumcision, um, and food laws, right? And, and what Paul is saying is that those kinds of works of the law are not incumbent on the followers of Christ, or, or at least not the Gentile followers of Christ. Now, that view has been heavily critiqued within the new perspective on Paul by John Barclay, for example. So there is no sort of monolithic new perspective on Paul. But what they are trying to do is reframe the way we look at Paul and the law, especially, and, and do a better job of uh, understanding that particular issue and also the relationship of law to faith. And what they all reject is the old Lutheran model, namely that grace is opposed to law, namely that faith is opposed to works, that sort of stuff. That is a no-fly zone for all of those people. <laughs> yeah, I think 
you know, as we look at these conversation partners, um, we write about this in the book a little bit. We're really trying to give kind of the major uh, voices that have really shaped the discussion, kind of in the history of ideas. Um, and I guess if you if you view these as a conversation, if um, Dunn stood up in the 80s and said, you know, E.P. Sanders, you've given us a great view of ancient Judaism, but your view on Paul wasn't that great. Well, the new perspective set out to try to give a better portrait of Paul in light of that reading. Um, kind of in, in reaction to that, uh, the Paul within Judaism has kind of said, you know, E.P. Sanders, you gave us a great reading of, of Judaism, um, but new perspective, you didn't give us a good reading of Paul. And so they're trying to correct the reading of Paul on the recorrection of the reading of ancient Judaism. Um, and so I, I do think that, you know, the Paul within Judaism group is, sees themselves as the inheritors of actually taking some of Sanders' big claims um, and kind of working them all the way down. Um, and so I think this just shows us that in this kind of history of ideas, um, this really is a book for students, um, not just ones formally enrolled, but people interested in, in Paul, uh, about how we're always... Um, interacting and reacting to kind of what's come before. And the New Perspective did that with the Lutheran model. Paul within Judaism has done that with the New Perspective. Um, and then, you know, the last group um, that we look at in the book, the apocalyptic group, uh, I would say has always been hovering um, in Pauline studies. Um, it's never been on the front burner of the stove, uh, but it's gone from the periphery to the center, um, I think, in many ways, um, by um, just kind of this reinvigorated sense in New Testament studies that we need, we need to be studying Paul. And so you can trace the apocalyptic group all the way back, I mean, way before um, E.P. Sanders. Uh, but it's kind of come to life again. Back to, back to the Damascus Road itself. <laughs> so, so with regard to the, I'm, I'm getting ahead a little bit here, but with regard to the apocalyptic Paul, just so our listeners understand what, what that means, um, what, what's kind of the, the central claim that's being made there? And, and why is why is it contentious? Yeah, I think the, the claim that's being made, and one part of it is just our definition of terms. We spend a, a couple pages in the book really saying, okay, what do we mean when we say apocalyptic? And it may sound like we're kind of splitting hairs here, but you know, it does matter how we use these terms. And that's probably the first problem is that there's just not a lot of agreement on what we mean when we say uh, apocalyptic. But broadly speaking, um, you know, that Paul is coming from a framework of Second Temple Judaism, um, that saw kind of otherworldly uh, in, uh, intervention uh, on God's behalf, um, and that he kind of finds himself to be a lot more like Ezekiel, a lot more like Zechariah, a lot more like the latter half of Daniel uh, than we've typically tended to read him. Um, and what gets contentious about that, at least in, in more recent scholarship, um, goes back to the fundamental question of kind of the new perspective in E.P. Sanders. What is Paul's relationship then with Judaism? Um, and in cer certain authors, that break tends to be a little bit more prominently stated um, and in some ways echoes some kind of pre-new perspective kind of language and even thought patterns. And so it's provided a lot of controversy uh, in terms of is it going back and in what ways is it going forward um, and, and how do we assess that? Is it also a question of um, not only continuity with Paul's Jewishness, and this is part of that, but also continuity between Old and New Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so how radical it kind of is this is this message? How much is he like John of Patmos, and how much mm -hmm. not so much? You know, and uh, and and of course they have a case. Lou Martin was one of the big instigators of this, followed by Bev Gaventa and others mm -hmm. over here. But the real origins of this are Ernst Kesemann back in Germany, and and he was reacting to Bultmann, among other things, uh, and and got that ball sort of rolling, and it, and it's a good question. I mean, Paul does talk about two ages. Paul does talk about the fact that Christ revealed His Son in me. That's mm. visionary language. There's no question about that. So the question is, how far do you push that particular image of Paul to explain the Pauline epistles in general? I mean, mm -hmm. he, he tells us that occasionally he had uh, a visionary experiences. He talks about one 14 years ago when he was caught up into the third heaven and that sort of thing. Um, my reading of this is, as the British would say, they kind of over-egged the pudding. 
They want to see the sort of apocalyptic dualities of darkness and light in this age and the age to come and all of that sort of everywhere in Paul. And I don't really think that works for everything in Paul. And here's the other catch, and that is you have to kind of assume that Paul thought the world was coming to an end real soon. In other words, you have to take a Schweitzerian view of, of the second coming when you're reading Paul. And bless his heart, Paul thought Jesus was coming back in his lifetime, and he was wrong. Well, no, <laughs> he didn't. And no, he's not wrong about the second coming. So some of this has to do with your general eschatology mm -hmm. and, and what you think about the second coming. Never mind dispensationalism. Um, ben, I was interested to read your take on N.T. Wright's wide-ranging corpus. You cover uh, quite a bit of ground there. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could just uh, talk, first of all, about Paul and the Roman imperial uh, cult. So you state that the narrative of the New Testament is more like the Lord of the Rings and less like a movie about Caligula. So how so, and and how does this uh, relate to, to Wright's thesis. Yeah. Well, I, I would simply say I, I, I agree uh, sort of 99.9% .9 with John Bar Barclay on this. Mm. I do not think that the New Testament is mainly written while looking over their shoulder at the, the growing imperial cult. I think there are places where it's implicitly critiqued because only Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not, and neither are any of these pagan gods. But I don't see a direct, overt critique of the rise of the imperial cult in the New Testament. I think there are places where there are little jabs at it directly or indirectly. I would not see this as a ma major issue for Paul. Uh, Paul is not mainly doing uh, you know, damage control. He's mainly presenting a positive great case for Christ and, is Lord. And and Wright would see a more direct engagement with the imperial cult, or is he backed off that now? Well, yes, he has, you know, over time, I mean, I even knew Tom in the 70s when he had hair, you know, <laughs> uh, I've, I've, I, I have watched the whole evolution of Nicholas Thomas Wright into mm -hmm. the present, and we've been friends throughout the whole period. And, um, and, and still very much are our friends. In fact, he's coming to give the 100th year anniversary addresses to Asbury Seminary in 2022 oh, wow. when we celebrate our 100th birthday, and we're very happy about having him come. Mm -hmm. but, but the thing is that, yes, it's a moving target with Tom. He, his views have, have uh, evolved over time. Some of his ideas he's been stubbornly holding on to, like Israel's still in exile, or, uh, you know, Christ is the embodiment of Israel going forward, and those who are in Christ are Israel. Um, those ideas are very problematic as far as I'm mm. concerned, uh, mm. because so far as I can see, the historical evidence is not that most Jews living in Galilee or Judea thought that that they were still in exile. I mean, if they had thought that, they wouldn't have talked about the diaspora the way they do uh, in various ways. So, no, they don't think they're still in exile. They think they're still subject to foreign powers. When was that not true of Israel, right? Yeah, for, br for brief periods throughout their history. Yeah, they didn't have to go into exile to feel oppression. They, they felt it right in their own country. So... I mean, I think that's a, a wrong reading it, where, pa, pa, where Tom will take like Deuteronomy 32, 33, 34, and then just use that as a sort of lens through which to read what Paul is really doing with his theology. And mm -hmm. the bigger problem, however, is that Paul is very clear in Romans 9 through 11 that Israel means Israel. That is non-Christians. It's Jews who have not yet or have even rejected Christ. Israel does not refer to the church. He never calls the church Israel, etc. So this, this idea that Jew and Gentile united in Christ uh, should simply be seen as the continuation of Israel, this is not Paul's view. 
and mm-hmm. and it and it no wonder uh, the the Jews Jewish evaluation of Paul recently mm-hmm. has gone ballistic over this because to them that's just simple supersessionism. Not only did you take over our Old Testament, now you're taking over the name Israel as well. And for them, that's just replacement theology. And of course, Tom denies that again and again. But, you know, his reading of Israel and Paul just doesn't work, frankly. So would that be your your central critique of Wright's work? Um, his the um the tendency to to associate the church too closely with israel and and the exile motif is is there another piece to your critique well, of there right are other pieces because he does a reformed reading on romans 8 9 etc as well and and that uh, from my he might not like to hear that that's uh, you know no he's fr- he, he freely admits he, he oh, okay. takes a more reformed reading on that even though people like John Piper have taken him to the woodshed for not being reformed enough in various ways and him having to write a whole book on justification by grace through faith to say I believe it please stop shooting at me you know <laughs> and so um, Yeah, uh, I would disagree with some of the ways he would read uh, the implications of the sovereignty of God and the election of God's people and those sorts of things. And Jason, um, if we move on from Wright to Dunn, uh, James Dunn, what what are some points of continuity and difference uh, between them uh, that you'd want to highlight? I mean, he's another towering figure, and and, and unless you're in New Testament studies, you might not have read his work uh, because he's not uh, a disseminator and quite this, he wasn't a disseminator quite in the same way that Wright was, is. Yeah, I think, you know, yeah, James Dunn covered, uh, you know, the same landscape, you know, as, as Wright did, but did so uh, in a different uh, degree. Uh, and you're right, it wasn't as widely publicized outside of certain circles um, in there. And so, yeah, I think there, there are, there's always a degree of continuity and discontinuity between, uh, as we mentioned, these new perspectives on Paul you know, there's a general sense of commonality, but one of them we've already mentioned is the Pistis Christu debate, where there's just flat out kind of disagreement on ways to read this phrase throughout Paul's letters. Um, you get disagreements, uh, as we already mentioned, on exile. Certainly one of the bigger um, kind of proponents of that critique um, was was done, among others, of saying, you know, I, I don't read Paul that way. I don't think this is there. Um, and I think that's one of the things that the book does that helps, I think, in a, in a good way kind of muddy the waters a little bit, that these aren't scholars in just like pockets and we're all writing for a certain goal, but that even within kind of these movements, there's, there's points of agreement and disagreement um, and change, you know, as we've already mentioned with Wright, you know, he changed his views a little bit. He tampered them down on Paul and Empire. And what I like to show people is that's part of the scholarly process, right? Uh, Whether you're an undergraduate student or a, or a, you know, senior scholar, you put an idea out in the, into scholarship, it gets critiqued, you refine it. And if you're a good scholar, <laughs> you know, you learn and grow and, and kind of refine. That's what we do. Um, and you see this with Dunn as well. You know, one of the big things I guess I wanted to make sure I did in the book is show Dunn's own progress on the phrase works of the law from the 80s to the 2000s. Um, and as students, you know, we need to keep reading in our fields. Um, and so I, what I wanted to do there was show that, yes, at one point he did say it is just the four big boundary markers of Sabbath, circumcision, food laws, and and those things. But later on, he actually wrote in print. Um, actually, I now had, he now has it referred to anything that the law requires. Um, and so again, you see this big movement over twenty years um, that hopefully we're all open to <laughs> with some of even our best ideas. Um, and I think Dunn really modeled that well of how do you learn from your critics, right? Um, and that's what makes for really really strong scholarship. So yeah, you're going to have disagreement, and that's part of the part of the process. One of the things that m- muddies the waters is lack of clarity on covenantal theology. Hmm. What do you mean by and that? What I mean by that is that in traditional Reformed theology, there's just sort of one covenant in multiple iterations. Uh, and, you know, traditional Reformed theology would even go back to the Noahic covenant or the Adamic covenant and, and then the Davidic covenant and the Mosaic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant and the New Covenant. And uh, in Reformed theology, traditional Reformed theology, 
The new covenant is simply a revised edition of these previous covenants, in particular, a revised edition or fulfillment of the Mosaic covenant. So the new covenant is not really a new covenant. It's a renewed covenant, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, that, not being clear about that, whether it is or is not a genuinely new covenant or not, affects your view of the law and everything else, your view of grace, you name it. And so part of the problem is lack of clarity on what's the nature of covenantal theology in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and all of that. And, um, you know, I, that, that, still, <laughs> that still needs some further clarification. And, and how would you describe the New Covenant then? Would you say this is a, a brand new covenant full stop? or it's, it's just a renewed covenant or, or somewhere in between? First of all, the new covenant involves a law, the law of Christ, says Paul. So there is law in the new covenant. Mm-hmm. It's not like the old covenant's all law and the new covenant's all grace. Mm-hmm. Sanders just blew up the, the theory that there was no grace in the old covenant. He made that very clear. He calls it covenantal gnomism. The law mm-hmm. is a response to God's grace of rescuing God's people in the Exodus, etc. But in the New Covenant, in the New Covenant, what's interesting about the New Covenant is that what counts as imperatives is some of the teachings that were found in the Old Covenant. Jesus' teaching, which adds some interesting new notes like no oath-taking, and by the way, no killing of enemies. Okay? And then the apostolic teaching by Paul. So, What's going on with the New Covenant is a genuinely new covenant, but there is some continuity with the previous Mosaic Covenant and the Abrahamic Covenant and various other things along the way. So it's not simply a renewal of the Mosaic Covenant, like, for example, Messianic Jews would say. Messianic Jews would say, those who are Jews who believe in Jesus, they would say the New Covenant is nothing more than just a renewal of the Mosaic Covenant. Um, and and I, I think that's absolutely not Paul's view. I don't even think it's Jesus's view. In fact, he thinks a new eschatological thing was happening. So um, it's it's not an either or proposition. Sure. But the new eschatological co- covenant is not simply a renewal of the Mosaic covenant. That's the best way to put it. Hmm. Jason, if I could go back to you for a moment, and uh, one of the things I noticed in the book is that. Um, Paul's views on the spirit have not played a major role in with any of the scholars you mentioned, except perhaps Dunn. Um, if you had to add a section on Pauline pneumatology, um, what are the key things that you would want to highlight, perhaps uh, key issues or figures that you'd want to highlight? And, and maybe I'd be curious to hear your opinion on why you think, you know, in terms of sort of perspectives on Paul, the spirit is not um, front and center. Yeah, no, it's definitely the missing piece, you know, I think of Pauline theology um, in this sense. And that's probably just with the hyper kind of mentalized, the hyper intellectual cloth that we're all cut from, <laughs> I think, you know, I think some of that is cultural and sociocultural at some level. But yeah, a chapter on this, and I highlight it a little bit in the book, but, you know, I think that's one of the pieces that's been left to the side. And you can wrap this up certainly with different um, philosophical movements of post-enlightenment, right? We don't really know what to do with something uh, like that, right? That's not something we can um, put in a test tube and and get results back on, right? And it's kind of like the, uh, even the worst case, right, with like, uh, certainly certainly like a Boltmonian reading, um, we should probably just leave that best aside because that's something that ancient people believed in, but we don't probably need to really believe in that anymore, um, cause we're, you know, enlightened. Um, so yeah, I think if we had a new chapter on that, you know, I'd certainly scholars like Gordon Fee, uh, would be in that chapter. Um, certainly other Pentecostal scholars. Um, I think a lot of the work by Frank Makia is really, really good on this. Uh, John Levinson, um, is really, really good on it. And, uh, yeah, I think Dunn is probably the, the scholar who's leaned into it the most. Some of his early work, of course, was on the spirit, um, and him and Max Turner, Uh, went back and forth for a good number of years (laughs) over uh, what is the Spirit doing in Luke and Acts. Um, But apart from them, you just don't see a lot of reference to the Spirit. And what I find so fascinating about that is that clearly in places like Romans um, 5 through 8, right, the Spirit is central to the argument that Paul is making 
uh, on who these people are, what God is up to, where God's plans are are, are unfolding. Um, and so I think to kind of leave that out, you leave a huge piece of the puzzle off the table. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, having been a former student of Gordon Fee, his landmark book, God's Empowering Presence, where he goes yeah. over every single reference or allusion or echo about the Holy Spirit in Paul's corpus. <laughs> And in detail, it, it, it does the exegesis and explanation on that. In his circles, Assemblies of God, Pentecostal circles in general, and some Arminian circles that are overlap with Pentecostal, I mean, that's had an enormous impact yeah. on the way things have been looked at from those who are really sort of spirit-central kind of groups. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is telling that the scholars that we are mainly dealing with, other than Dunn, are, you know, they're not really uh, engaging mm. with that sort of stuff very much at all. Mm-hmm. And, and to their cost, really, because that's an aspect of Pauline studies that needs to be highlighted. But it's not a part of the recent new perspective discussions. Yeah. Uh, I want to switch gears to do a speed round here. Um, so I'll I'll go back and forth, and I'll I'll kick it off with Jason, and then we'll we'll uh, uh, go between you. So, Jason, how do you solve a problem like Maria? Find a new song. Um, ben, what what's love got to do with it? Well, I don't think I would ask Tina Turner. I think I would uh, rather go with uh, Joni Mitchell's uh, exposition of First Corinthians thirteen. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jason, uh, serious question here. Um, do you know the Muffin Man? I do not, nor do I want to. Ben, what's a book that changed your life? Let, let's uh, let's assume the Bible's one of them. Uh, if you had to highlight one other. Oh, Shakespeare. Hmm. Reading the plays of Shakespeare. Uh, it's, that's, if you really engage with that, that's life-changing. Jason, do you have one? I would probably say the the work of Dallas Willard. Mm. Yeah, good good pick there. Um, okay, uh, Ben, knock knock. Who's there? Control freak. Okay, now 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 you say control freak who? Control freak <laughs> who? <laughs> Got it. All right, uh, Jason. Um, what's the difference between a cat and a comma? Ooh, commas are way more useful. Uh, a cat has claws at the end of pause, and a comma is a pause at the end of a clause. Excellent. I like that one. Perfect. Okay. Uh, ben, what's the most significant book in biblical studies in the last 50 years? Well, that would be hard to say, but... You got to pick one. Okay. I'm going to pick one from the last, from the 21st century. I'm going to pr- pick Paul and the Gift by John Barclay. Okay. You, you weren't the first to do that. Jason, do you have one that you'd pick? I would probably say Jesus Remembered by mm. Dunn. Okay. I think, yeah. Uh, Jason, uh, let's say you're a, a low-grade millionaire, multimillionaire. You have like 5 to $6 million. Um, and would you pay 225000 to take a Virgin Galactic flight into space? No, uh, o- only because, uh, one, probably not a lot of people on that. I'm one of the world's largest extroverts, so... Unless there's a whole bunch of people going, probably not worth it. Um, okay, Ben, uh, one of the things that we do as scholars is is review each other's books. So I put a, a word in, I, I asked Google for a random word, and I stuck that word into Amazon. And I'd like you to, and it, um, the word was cord. And the book that came up when I plugged that word into Amazon was A Scarlet Cord by Deborah Rainey. So, how many stars do you give it, and why? Well, I haven't read it. Well, that's it. That doesn't matter. I have no clue. I know the Scarlet Letter upside down and backwards. If you want okay. that one, so maybe maybe you wouldn't give it too many stars because this this is too derivative. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to eke a review out of you. Okay, uh, Jason. Um, random word for you was uh, envelope. And the, the book was 13 Little Blue Envelopes by Maureen Johnson. And just to give a little context here, here's the write-up. Ginny Blackstone never thought she'd spend her summer vacation backpacking across Europe. 
but that was before she received the first little blue envelope from, from Aunt Peg. So how many stars do you give it? I will give it uh, one. Ooh, and it's just a reminder that self-publishing might be a crime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like That's that, Jason. That's good. That's great. Um, ben, uh, what's... Well, I, I asked you the other one. So, Jason, I'm going to stick with you for this. Uh, what's one trend in biblical studies that... Uh, one idea in biblical studies that you think needs to die? Yeah, Jason. Sorry, sorry I'm going to stick with you. I think the trend that needs to die would be probably the sense that we can't be connected uh, with our work uh, kind of in a, in a meaningful way, um, but that we need to kind of check those things at the door. <laughs> um, I think those things that bring us passion or we find a place that needs uh, further excavation, um, I think kind of reuniting those in a healthy balance is what we need rather than a, I'm disinterested from my subject. Yeah, good. Um, all right, back to the, the main interview here. I just have a couple more questions. We're coming toward the end of our time. Um, so uh, among the, the big issues, uh, elephants in the room uh, in, in Pauline studies is the question of authenticity. Um, do we have just seven authentic letters uh, or eight or 10 or even 13? Um, so do you see trends on that subject going one way or another? Um, and how do those decisions affect Pauline theology, our, our framing of what is Pauline theology? Well, one of the interesting things in writing a commentary on all of the Pauline letters is you have to read a bunch of commentaries as well as monographs and articles. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is to see the number of scholars that say things like the majority of scholars think Ephesians is post-Pauline. But when you actually read the people that had to spend one, two, or ten years of their life writing in a commentary on Ephesians, in fact, the vast majority of them think Paul is responsible for this in one way or another, even if he used some kind of scribe. Okay? So yeah. there's a lot of disinformation out there about that particular issue of Pauline or post-Pauline. But what most clouds the issue is the whole issue of scribes. No question Paul used scribes. The question is, how much freedom did he give them in the composing of the letters? Mm -hmm. My view would be, this taking the, the extreme from the end of the Pauline corpus, the pastoral epistles, my view would be that in regard to First and Second Timothy and Titus, the person who actually wrote these letters in their own vocabulary with their own grammar is Luke, but writing for Paul. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is if you do your homework, you'll discover there are 42 words or phrases that are found nowhere but in Luke Acts and in the pastoral epistles. Something is going on there, just from the, in terms of grammar, syntax, and vocabulary. I think there's no question. And not accidentally, there is this line, Paul says, Luke alone is with me. Okay, uh, what should we think about that? So, mm. you know, I, I, I like to put that one, the, the voice is the voice of Paul, but the hands are the hands of Luke. And, and see, I would not say that makes this a post-Pauline or a pseudonymous document. I right. would say it's Pauline in spirit and in uh, substance, but the right. way it's framed is a Lucan way of framing things. And so when you start taking scribes into account and ask the question, how much freedom did they have in composing this, that, or the other? Well, there are a few people in the Pauline circle, like a Timothy, like a Titus, like a Silas, like a Luke, who very well, who were literate, who very well could have helped Paul with these things. And then there's the guy named Tertius mentioned in Romans 16, who seems to have been the person who wrote down all but just a little bit of Romans 16 for Romans 1 through 16 for Paul. So I think we need to better frame the question. What counts as authorship? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I think the, the questions that we ask kind of determine the answers that we get. Um, and I think for this question in particular, it's amazing how two plus two equals four all the time. Um, and so I think as you read through the scholarship on it, you know, and who, who's not read, you know, one of the big scholars that has not been read on this is, is Luke Timothy Johnson. 
um, and his anchor Bible commentary on this issue of authorship. Um, and so I think, you know, if we continue to use the same paradigms of, of judgment uh, on these issues, uh, we just need to begin asking the questions, why are these the paradigms of, of judgment? Um, and how do they not necessarily answer the big questions? And the only other piece I would, I would hand, I'd, I'd add to this, and this doesn't uh, work for everyone, but depending on your view of canon and a high view of canon and the role of the Spirit uh, kind of in guiding the church um, in, in the selection of books and the usage of books, uh, to me that always has a, it needs to have a piece of the puzzle that what in the church's wisdom, um, I don't think they were fools, right? I don't think they were easily duped, especially at a time as we know when they are looking for forgeries and, and fake documents. Um, you know, I, th- I think there is a sense of trusting the guiding of the Spirit um, and, and, and not in a non, you know, thinking way of, oh, it must be by Paul because it's in the canon, but by coming from, you know, this hermeneutic of trust rather than suspicion. So, uh, that raises another question um, that that I've wondered about before, and that is to the extent to which ascertaining Paul's theology is important. Um, so, presumably, as people for whom this Bible, this New Testament is scripture, does it, does it matter or how does it matter that it's Paul or not? And, and to what extent should we even be trying to get Paul's theology as opposed to the theology of the New Testament or sections of the New Testament or particular books? Well, one of the things I would say is that there's a difference between the theologies of individual authors or consortiums in the New Testament and biblical theology, or even New Testament theology. Uh, uh, New Testament theology is uh, a a synthesis of the various theologies of Mm -hmm. the writers of the New Testament uh, with some deletion. You know, because the tendency is to see, well, where are the things that are similar in all of this, and what were they all saying, and those kinds of things. And biblical theology involves the whole Old Testament as well. So I'm perfectly happy for somebody to spend their time pursuing Pauline theology as long as they understand that uh, this is just one of the theological voices in the New Testament canon. There's a reason there are a lot of these other voices. And frankly, Paul is not the trump card to discredit these other voices. We need to hear them all or else they wouldn't be in the canon at all. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how I would say it. It is important for understanding the exegesis of Paul's letters to get at Paul's theology. That is certainly important. Yeah, the, the piece I would add, I think, goes back to Dunn, and it always made a formative impact. But, you know, if, if we just took most of the letters, right, of Paul, uh, we would have a theology of the controversies. Um, and I think that's a really helpful way of saying, you know, it's, it's the controversies that cause Paul to write. So the reason we get something on the Lord's table, right, in 1 Corinthians is because there's a problem there. Um, there's a reason why, in large ways, um, you know, resurrection doesn't make a huge appearance in the book of Romans, but it does in 1 Corinthians. Um, and so Dunn was right, I think, to say, you know, we're kind of looking askance at quote unquote Pauline theology through the problems. And of course, the apocalyptic writer um, Becker did a great job of this, of coherence and contingency. Um, and I think that's a helpful way of saying when we look at Paul's theology, right, we're seeing. Um, kind of the tip of the iceberg, and there's a whole foundation underneath. And, you know, Ben has written on this with the the narrative framework of Paul's theology, the narrative world of Paul, um, that the, these big pieces still remain under the surface at some level from what she operates out of. And um, before we get right to the end, I just want to ask Jason, if we go back to the apocalyptic Paul for a moment, because um, it, it's an area I have not read in, um, but I see sort of conversations about it. Um what are what are some of, we've talked about what it is a little bit what are some of your critiques of the apocalyptic paul yeah so in writing the chapter it really was uncovering okay who is saying what and how are they using the terms and how are we translating these terms to get at kind of a coherent framework and i think where i came down to it um i think my biggest critiques were of more of the martin variety uh with the language of um invasion the language of kind of alien nature of what Paul was doing because it just made him so radically, radically different. Um, so I would say I kind of find myself in between the new perspective and the Paul within Judaism that I do want to see a good degree of continuity 
between Paul with what's come before what's come before him and what's come after him. Um, and so for me, the biggest critique was the the discontinuity of you know if we didn't have Paul, we we wouldn't have you know the the New Testament. Um, you know, and I would want to say yes. I mean, Paul certainly makes a stand, makes an impact, particularly on the Gentile question. Um, but that you know, there's a lot more going on here that Paul seems to see. You know, this unfolding of the plan of God, um, this outworking of God's plan, kind of certainly in a, in a new chapter um, with all these Gentiles, but it's one that was not entirely unforeseen. Um, and so, yeah, I think my critiques are some of the the, the dualities that tend to permeate the language uh, of a lot of the writers, um, kind of the bifurcations of things that I think Paul and Second Temple Jews maybe held a little bit closer together um, and not kind of separating those out so much that Paul is just unlike any other. Not that I don't think he was a unique individual. I, I think he certainly was. Um, that's why we're still reading his letters, you know, 2,000 years later. Um, but, you know, I think there is far more continuity than um, is given credit. Yeah, and I I, um, I wondered as I was reading that chapter too about the degree to which there's been work done on the way that newness language itself is part of the Old Testament. So y- you have repeated claims about the sort of new, radically new cosmic work of God in bringing the the people of God back from exile or um, you know raising up a leader, and so things that if you over literalize the newness language, you you would have thought that there were invasions, so to speak, and the apocalyptic invasions throughout the the history of Israel. To some extent, there were because that's how the prophets framed these events. But on the other hand, what we see in Paul it seems is picking up on that way of framing new events that's already in continuity with the Old Testament. So I, I wondered about whether there's been kind of work around that. There is something to be said about that. We just had a dissertation done by a person who's worked in both Old and New Testament on new lang- newness language in Isaiah. Oh. In Isaiah. Oh, and what she demonstrated to my satisfaction is that at least in Isaiah, the newness language does mean new. It does mm-hmm. not mean renew. Mm-hmm. He, he's, when he talks about a new heaven and a new earth, he's not kidding. Mm-hmm. Um, he's talking about something really new that that is not a continuation of what's come before and uh, i mean i found that very interesting to to yeah. say the least and so i guess we're going to continue to adjudicate these kind of issues over yeah. and and over again but yeah. uh, if if we understand that god is continuously operating in the human sphere then of course we should expect some new things as well as some things that are renewed as well. And, yeah. uh, and so the question is, do we put the emphasis on the wrong syllable sometimes yeah. or not? That's kind of the question. Yeah. What, Pauline studies is continuing to change. What, what chapters do you think will need to be written of the 2020 to 2030 decade? Yeah, that's a good question. I would, you know, I think we've already mentioned a little bit, I think the Paul within Judaism um, group is continuing to grow um, and gain, you know, a lot of good voices and a lot of good, uh, interesting conversations that I think will need to be like the new perspective, right? Kind of weighed and, and sifted and see what sticks and what doesn't. Um, I think it's still kind of in the early movements, you know, of, of that movement. Um, I think there's a renewed interest in more of the social side of Paul. Um, you know, there's recent works on Paul and the poor. Um, so as much as we've looked at kind of like the big hallmarks of Reformation theology, right? Uh, Paul was a, a pastor, church planner, missionary, working with people across a wide gamut of life. And so I think we're going to see a lot more work kind of turned on that side of what was Paul's work in ministry like with various people. There's a, a new book uh, by Terry Donaldson on uh, Gentile identity and self-identity language. Mm-hmm. Um, the word ethnos doesn't mean Gentile, and yet it gets translated Gentile mm-hmm. all the time. Because that's how Jews did othering of people that were not Jews. All those other nations, which is what the word really means, it means other ethnic groups, other nations, uh, are just sort of all lumped together by Jews as not us. Mm-hmm. It's, it's othering language. And, and his book traces the use of ethnos 
first by Jews, then by Jewish Christians, then by Gentile Christians, then by a church that's overwhelmingly Gentile. And, and it's really fascinating uh, to study this whole issue of social identity. And yeah. how do we talk about ourselves as well as how do we talk about others? This whole mm -hmm. social identity aspect of sociology has sort of blown up in the last mm -hmm. 20 years because of a variety of scholars like Paul Trabilco and, and, and Terry mm -hmm. Donaldson. And I think that that's going to keep going. That's yeah. definitely going to keep going as a, a social way of, of reading the the letters of Paul and 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 rightly so because it's producing some interesting insights. Mm -hmm. As we uh, round this out, I just wondered if each of you could comment briefly on how you your scholarship in Paul has shaped the way you see the church. Well, one of the things that came across to me loud and clear is uh, that when we talk about the ecclesia to theu, first of all, the word ecclesia is not a technical term for church, even though it often gets translated that way. It just means assembly. And it was first used to the democratic assembly in Athens back in the golden age of Greece. Um, so it just means an assembly. And I think Paul has deliberately picked this word for the community of Jews and Gentiles united in Christ. And, and, What's interesting to me is he's prepared to talk about the assembly of God as a local expression, which he calls the assembly of God in Corinth, for example. But he's also prepared to talk about the whole entity. I persecuted the ecclesia to theu, the assembly of God. I persecuted it wherever I found it, right? not just a particular local expression. Well, what comes out of that ecclesiology is that Paul believes that the body of Christ is uh, writ large. It involves all Christians everywhere. And, and, it's, and, a, and there's a whole expression of the body of Christ in each locale. So Paul can say to the Corinthians, you've got an arm, you've got a leg, you've got a neck, you've got this, and you can't say this part isn't just as valuable as that part. Each instance, Insta uh, instantion of the body of Christ is a full instantion, even if it's a small local church. It's, it's a whole representation of the body of Christ, but at the same time, it's all part of a much larger entity called the Church of God, if you will. So, uh, ecclesiologies that think that the church drops off with the front door of their local church are simply wrong. It's false. It's, it's not true. And the other part of that is that Paul believes in a hierarchical model of leadership. Now, it's not a gender hierarchy, but he believes that there are apostles and co-workers of apostles. He believes at the local level there are elders and perhaps deacons. There is a leadership structure to the church, which is not just sort of Quakerism. That's clear as well from reading Paul's letters. So, when you really come to grips with all of that, you have to ask the question, as a Protestant, you have to ask the question, does my church model the model of what counts as church that we see in Paul's letters? And often that's not the case. Yeah, I would say for me, I like the what Ben said about the global expression uh, of the church, that it isn't, isn't just our local communities or even the communities in our country, but the communities around the world that make up this marvelous body of, of God. Um, so I think that's always something to, to be reminded of. And Paul certainly was a traveler, right? He, he got around um, to various places. Um, the other piece I'd add to that, I think of how Paul helps me kind of view the church. It really all comes back to me, to 1 Corinthians kind of 1 through 4. Um, and I think Paul's nature of true wisdom um, in humility and in weakness. Um, and I think that helps in my work uh, in the church. I also, I also serve on a church staff. Um, of how we suffer well, um, and certainly a pandemic has um, forced that anew on us and shown us our, our, our weakness in that. But I think, you know, for Paul, it is this, um, as others have said, you know, the, the discipline of hope, that God's promises are true, um, that God is rec reconciling all things in Christ, um, even in the midst of our trials and our tragedies and our sufferings, um, that God is working something good uh, through that. And so I think for me, it, it in the best moments, uh, helps me have hope um, that 
today, the work that we do, whether it's in our writing or in our preaching or in our teaching, that we are continuing on with the good work that God has given us and that he will see fit, you know, one day to, um, yeah, reconcile all things. So Paul, Paul teaches me to hope. Yeah. And I would say, I mean, I've traveled all over the world <laughs> dealing with the church in you name it. I mean, just last week I did a gigantic podcast on women in ministry for 260 pastors and churches in Indonesia from here in beautiful downtown Lexington. But I have traveled everywhere and found genuine Christians everywhere. <laughs> everywhere I've gone, I've found genuine Christians. Some of them are Protestants, some of them are Catholics, some of them are Orthodox. Um, uh, I've, I've given lectures in the Vatican and found various Catholic brothers that I, I hold dear. And, and so one of the things that having a broader ecclesiology does for you is it reminds you that God's not finished with us, and there are a lot of different flavors of Christian, and that you need to be as broad as the Bible is broad and as narrow as the Bible is narrow in defining what that counts as, uh, who really counts as a Christian. Um, and, and, you know, for me, uh, I'm not an ecumaniac, but I am ecumenical and irenic and, and believe that we as the body of Christ need to stand together in a world that is increasingly anti-Christian. Well, that's a good word to leave us with. Ben and Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with OnScript today. Sure. Thanks so much, Matt. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate.